we're going to get started. So welcome to the, the mid-morning session here on the third day. So I congratulate you for hanging around, staying here. If you've got a hangover, I'm sorry, but um, uh, it's great to be in Los Angeles. Uh, my name's Justin Johnson. I'm, um, uh, I work for a small consulting firm in Vermont uh, and was a former member of the Reggie board, which is why I got co-opted into moderating this panel where we're gonna talk a little bit about what's happening in the Northeast. Um, I will just have my fellow presenters introduce themselves, including the one on the end who's unadvertised in the program, um, who's gonna provide a little bit of market um, sort of information and questions. But Andrew, why don't you introduce yourself real quick? Sure. Uh, my name is Andrew McKeon. I'm the executive director of Reggie Inc. I'm Michael Dowd. I am the director of the Air and Renewable Energy Division for the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. And I'm Dan McGraw. I am head of Americas for Carbon Pools. So we want to talk a little bit about what's happening with Reggie uh, today. Reggie, as you've heard a little bit about today and yesterday, is um, uh, the Reggie region has reduced its uh, emissions by around 50%. Uh, looks like we're heading for, towards 65 based on what we heard this morning. Um, and it's 11 years old now, so I'm not sure how many years a, a, a a carbon um, program year equates to, you know, if it was a dog, it'd be getting pretty ancient by now, but um, it's certainly getting close to being it's a teenager. It's definitely not a dog. It's not a dog, <laughs> it's, but it's, um, it's, been, it's been a successful 11 years. A lot has changed in the world in the 11 years since it started. Um, and so, you know, one of the things, and Andrew will get to this in a moment, I think it stands out about Reggie is it's um, sort of built in capacity to kind of um, look at itself and make adjustments and mature and move forward. And so I think we've seen a little bit of that. So um, I think what we'll do is we'll start with Andrew to give a bit of just sort of Reggie 101. Um, then Michael is here because obviously everyone wants to know what's happening with Reggie expansion. And Virginia is, uh, comes up fairly early and often in that conversation. And then I haven't worked out what Dan's going to do yet, but we'll get to that shortly. So Andrew, why don't you go? Sure, thanks. Thanks, Justin. And uh, thank you all for coming here for, for our uh, panel today. Um, I was once a, a, one of the Al Gore climate cavalry, so I don't feel like I can talk without using slides. So I will uh, give a little bit of a Reggie 101, you know, look at our track record and the outlook uh, for the future. So this is a map of the Northeast, and you see uh, all of the Reggie states in dark blue there, and then the red hashtags are the two states Virginia and New Jersey that uh, we've been in long discussions with over the last year, year and a half, uh, and, and you know, look to have those two states uh, become participants at some time soon. And I just wanted to you know, also use this to show you that uh, you know, these are the original 13 colonies, so we, we have a history here, and we were also the original uh, CU2 budget trading programs in the United States. So. Uh, our program is about reducing emissions in the power sector using auctions. Uh, auctions are very, very critical to this, uh, access to the market. The allowances are fungible, bankable, and tradable. So think of them as a US dollar. It doesn't matter who mints the US dollar. Uh, it's a US dollar, and you can use it for, for any of those purposes. So I think originally when the program started, there was concern about can a Rhode Island allowance be used for a compliance obligation in New York? There really is uh, none of that concern. The fungibility is understood. The bankability is really important because that means that folks can buy allowances now and use them uh, for a, a, a rainy day. Uh, and the tradability in the secondary market is also critical in, in, in keeping the liquidi liquidity of that market. And it applies to 25 megawatt or greater fossil fuel fired uh, power utilities. Uh, this year, 2019, we have a, uh, a cap of uh, 80.2 million. And uh, life to date, uh, you know, uh, Justin was mentioning uh, last year was a big year for us, 10, 10 years. And in those 10 years, we reached a $3 billion in proceeds mark. Uh, program review, critical part of the success of the program is uh, set of stepping back and looking at you know, how we're doing, uh, what can we do to improve. Uh, I think one of the, uh, one of the keys to, to, to this, the thriving of Reggie is that uh, ability to do that. And the improvements announced from the 2017 program review, another 30% decline uh, in emissions from 2020 to 2030, uh, a new uh, innovation called the ECR, Emissions Containment Reserve, 
uh, I'll describe that uh, along with the CCR, which is the cost containment reserve. Those two mechanisms are basically, uh, could be thought of as uh, sort of uh, speed bumps on the road to either the price going too high at an auction, and that was the CCR was basically put in that if the price goes above a, a CCR uh, trigger price, uh, more allowances would be put into the auction to slow that price rise. So now we've come up with this innovation of the ECR, which uh, on the other hand, if the price is dropping below an ECR trigger, allowances will be removed from auction to slow that fall of the price. So they're not hard, uh, they're not hard uh, upper or lower limits, they're soft limits and uh, used, used for those purposes that I described. And then the bank adjustment. Uh, bank adjustment will be happening in uh, the period 2021 through 2025, looking at the bank at the end of 2020 and uh, basically uh, uh, reducing the bank to, to zero over that five-year period with the bank adjustment. And that's an innovation that goes way back to when there was a, 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 a very great oversupply of allowances back in the uh, you know, 2012, 2013 days. Bank adjustment helped the program get back on its feet in terms of a, st a stable price signal. So uh, in terms of the sort of overall takeaways here, I would say uh, four points. Expect the unexpected, auction and investment over free allocation, consensus and bipartisanship, and constancy of purpose. So those, so let's talk about the first one, expect the unexpected. I think I just alluded to uh, the issues that happened when there was an oversupply of allowances. Uh, I think that what the states have learned as they've gone through this process is that, um, you know, be more ambitious. Uh, they hadn't been ambitious enough and that resulted in, in that excess of allowances. Uh, things do happen and you've got to adjust for them. Again, the program review being one mechanism for doing that. Uh, next point about auctioning and investing over free allocation. I think one, one of the other very critical aspects of the success of the program is that investment of auction proceeds back into renewable energy, energy efficiency, uh, programs of that nature. Um, it's really helped reduce customer bills and, and made the program uh, much more robust and certainly uh, popular because the states are getting money but it's not hurting consumers and it's actually uh, creating jobs and improving, uh, even improving the health of the, of the region. And then consensus and bipartisanship. There's no votes on, on the red, uh, you know, in Reggie. It's all the agency heads coming to consensus and moving forward on that basis. So um, I remember years ago learning about sort of Japanese management principles and how it took them a long time to make a decision, but once they made it, it was solid because everyone had come together. And that's sort of how, how Reggie works. Uh, things don't move as fast as folks would like, but once those decisions are made, they're solid, and those states uh, stay with it. Uh, bipartisanship, we had five Republican governors until recently in the program. So this wasn't a left-right Republican-Democrat uh, program. It's a bipartisan, successful uh, investment program. And then constancy of purpose. I think uh, if folks don't think things have happened fast enough, they should understand that over the 10 years, and when we started in 2008, a lot has happened in 10 years between uh, economic upheavals and political upheavals, but this program still moves forward uh, with that constancy of purpose. So those are sort of the big takeaways. And then I wanted to share some sort of charts that you know, sort of tell the story of this is what we're trying to go for and how Reggie has succeeded in doing that, which is decoupling the blue line, which is a GDP per capita, per capita and uh, carbon intensity. So you see as, as emissions are going down, we're maintaining or increasing uh, GDP, and that's sort of the goal of these types of programs is to decouple there. Uh, investment of proceeds, 58% of the investment in proceeds is going to energy efficiency. I think by far that has been uh, you know, one, of the, one of the things that has really helped keep the customer bills down. Uh, even if the electricity prices in the Reggie region have uh, gone up slightly faster, just slightly faster than the nation as a whole, the customer bills in the Reggie region have actually gone down uh, uh, relative to, to the country as a whole. And that is due to these investments also uh, clean, clean and renewables, greenhouse gas abatement, uh, direct bill assistance by some of the states, and then slices for administration and, and for Reggie Inc. We try not to take too much of the pie there. State track record. So this is comparing uh, what 2005 looked like versus what, where we are today. Is that right? Am I reading that correctly? Yes. So you can see uh, the big takeaways here is look at the brown 22%. That's coal-fired energy in, in the region in uh, 2005 and you see where that is in 2017, it's 
So we're seeing that migration away from, uh, and petroleum as well, migration away from petroleum and, and coal for electricity generation. Yes, natural gas uh, has been a big part of it, but also renewables. You can see the renewables, the green, blue, and blue, uh, more than 50% of that pie. So uh, a very good success story in terms of source migration. This is another way of looking at that chart where petroleum and coal are way down and renewables uh, uh, way up. And then th this slide, I'd, I'd have you look at um, the, 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 the sector, 36.7% uh, is the transportation sector for all of the United States. In Reggie, it's 47% now. So what that means is we've been so good at reducing that yellow piece of pie, the electric power, that now transportation is becoming a bigger piece of the pie. And this is one of the reasons why we have all of the nine Reggie states participating in, a, in a, uh, looking at uh, the future of transportation through a program like TCI, Transportation Climate Initiative. Uh, so actually, just, just uh, as a, an aside, if you looked at the Reggie states in 2005 versus the Reggie states today, uh, it was about 37% for transportation in 2005. So the point here is a lot more is going on in transportation because we, we've actually been very effective uh, at addressing the utility sector stuff. And a couple of other things, and I'll, I'll wrap this up. Uh, analysis Group has done the uh, studies over, over the years, in the years 2015 to 2017, have seen 1.3 billion in e economic benefit, an addition of 14,000 job years, and 460 million in energy bill savings. Uh, and then all time o over the period of the program, something on the order of four billion in net economic benefits and tens of thousands of additional jobs. And uh, actually I'll be speaking on Sunday at a doctor's conference in Washington DC uh, talking about public health and, and uh, greenhouse gas reduction and Apt Associates put together a great report in 2017 where they actually quantified things like uh, the number of lives saved, 300 to 800 lives saved, uh, reductions in asthma attacks, over 8,000, 39,000 lost uh, d job days averted, and then uh, almost six, uh, 6 billion in health savings and other benefits. And looking ahead, we talked about Virginia and New Jersey are in the process of enacting rules or have enacted rules. Uh, and uh, Reggie has a model of innovative way to manage supply and demand and informing, uh, informative to other states. We're always open to talking to any jurisdiction that's interested in hearing about the sex, success of our program. So that's the 101. Uh, I don't think any of that will be on the quiz. But, uh. right. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Andrew. And I, I think it is important to point out that, you know, one of the things that I think that Reggie has tried to do over the years, certainly once it was up and running, was really work to have the benefits quantified. Um, as part of making the program sort of more, rust, um, more robust and, and survive the sort of ebb and flow and political changes, you know, being able to articulate what the benefits of the program are has been important. And so the work that APT and the analysis group have done has been, I think, really useful and something that um, I think collectively we need to do a better job of. Um, uh, in running these programs is really to sort of talk about what the benefit was. Mm -hmm. But um, as you saw, uh, Reggie is looking at, at some imminent expansion uh, uh, and Virginia is uh, right there at the forefront. So Michael Dowd from Virginia is here to tell us uh, what the latest is. Okay, thank you, Justin. Um, and it's, it's great to be here. Uh, for me, coming out to the West Coast and coming to this conference in particular is, a, is like stepping into another world. Uh, on the plenary panel, we just heard, I, I heard my, my friend uh, Jared Snyder and the folks from California and Oregon basically playing can you top this with respect to the ambition of their climate programs in their states. And that's great. Um, let me tell you how the other half lives. <laughs> and and I'm, I may be one of the few people here from one of those, I think they're called battleground states or purple states states, um, but uh, there are still many states in the country uh, for which the basic political questions as to how one goes forward with climate regulations are yet unresolved, and Virginia, and Virginia is one of those states. Um, we are on the cusp of joining Reggie, hopefully. Participating in Participating, Reggie. <laughs> that's right. And, and, Nobody and, joins. And that's been a, a, and that's a, a very big term of art, participation versus joining and membership. Mm -hmm. um, to the you know, folks out there, it might not seem 
like there's a difference there, but believe me, there are huge differences in how those terms are interpreted. Um, so before I go on, I just to say a couple of things about Virginia. Um, Jamestown was founded in uh, 1607, 13 years before the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock. The first Thanksgiving was held in Virginia, not in Massachusetts, as, as some folks think. Um, Oh, let me see. My office, actually, I'm lucky enough, we're in, a, we're in a high rise. I look out onto the Virginia State Capitol. It's a beautiful building designed by Virginia native Thomas Jefferson. Um, and it houses the oldest continual lawmaking body in the Western Hemisphere. Um, more recently, uh, Virginia is home to the largest naval base in the world. And Virginia also considers itself the home of the internet. Now. I, I, I don't mean any of that to brag, but I do mean to say it in terms of, and I, and I think like any other state, most other states, uh, Virginia is very self-confident and very self-assured of its place in the country, if not the world. Um, so while we're on the cusp of joining Reggie, and that may not happen, and I'll, I'll discuss why, but if we don't join Reggie, it won't be because, as Dan said yesterday, because of another scandal. It will be because of uh, politics, divided government, which we have in Virginia. Second, some very unique questions of state constitutional law that nobody understands at this point in time, and maybe we'll get some clarification on it going forward, and a very, uh, fortuitous or tragic twist of fate that occurred a couple of years ago, and I get into all of that in a second. Um, Virginia, as I said, is divided government. Um, governors, going back to Governor McAuliffe, uh, our previous governor, have been very supportive of climate regulation. We were one of the first states, one of the very active states to jump on board developing a clean power plan. Well, the Supreme Court came, and the Supreme Court told us, pens down. Uh, at that point in time, the governor of Virginia, Governor McAuliffe, uh, in, invoked a state or, or called a state work group together to figure out ways, to look at ways that Virginia could regulate climate emissions from electric utilities uh, under existing state law. So that was back in 2016. Of course, then we had the election and it became certain we weren't going to have federal regulation at that point in time. Um, we then had 2017, and, and this was an omen of things to come. In 2017, we had both pro and, pro, pro and anti-Reggie legislation in our General Assembly. Now, the anti-Reggie legislation passed all the way up through and went to the governor's desk, and he vetoed it. The General Assembly could not override Governor McAuliffe's veto. On the other hand, there, were also, there was also a pro-Reggie bill. That never made it out of subcommittee because of the, uh, the way things worked. Uh, uh, the numbers of Republicans and Democrats on, on the committee at that point in time. Well, but in 2017, the General Assembly, and this is the omen of things to come that we're, we're looking at today, the General Assembly in the budget put in a, a budget provision that said, DEQ, my agency that's responsible for, for going forward with these regulations, we could not do anything on the Clean Power Plan. It was pens down on the Clean Power Plan and the Supreme Court stay was lifted. Well, that didn't affect us because we weren't working on that anyways because we couldn't. We'd have gone as far as we could go, so no one thought of challenging it at that point in time. Um, so back, we'll go to 2017, uh, 2018. Again, in the 2018 session, there were pro and anti-Reggie uh, bills, and they both, uh, the pro-Reggie uh, pro bills never got out of committee. The anti-Reggie anti bills got through committee, uh, got through, were passed in both houses, but uh, were vetoed again, again by the governor. Um, all this time, we were going forward at DEQ developing our regulation, and in um, uh, late last year, we had a regulation that went out for public comment, and uh, it, uh, we just presented it to our State Air Pollution Control Board last Friday, mm -hmm. and it was passed not on a unanimous vote, passed five to two. There were two members of the board that did not think joining Reggie was, one member didn't think it was important, we were achieving those reductions anyways, the other member did not believe in climate change. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
we have a rule that's passed, ready to link to Reggie. It differs from Reggie in two, well, in one significant respect and in, in, and in one minor respect. Significant respect is we cannot raise money directly. We're using something called a, uh, a consignment auction that indeed I believe we, we worked through with the folks at Resources for the Future, but my understanding it's based on how California does it under AB 32. Um, we couldn't tell folks like that. We couldn't tell folks in Virginia about the, uh, about the California connection to our consignment auction approach. <laughs> we had to do that because we can't raise money in Virginia without General Assembly approval. It was the only way we figured we could go forward uh, on, on pure executive action. The other difference, and this is a slighter difference between our program and Reggie's, is that our bill, our program specifically recognizes environmental justice going forward. Environmental justice will be a, a key component of our program review in Virginia as we go forward. Um, so we have a rule. It's all set to be go to our, uh, it's all set to be implemented here in Virginia. However, let me step back to our General Assembly. Let me go back to 2016. Um, we had the election in 2016, we had a General Assembly election in Virginia in 2017, we're in off years. The blue wave came, and, but the General Assembly didn't switch. What happened was in the House, the Virginia House of Delegates, it was a dead draw. And it hinged on one delegate, a, a delegate down in, a Republican delegate down in uh, the Tidewater region. And just to digress for a second, Tidewater is very susceptible to climate change. Virginia actually is the state, I understand, that's second most susceptible to climate change and sea level rise next to Louisiana. Well, this Republican legislator was down by a couple of votes, then went up by a vote. Well, whatever it was, at the end, it turned out to be a dead draw in, out of about 40,000 votes cast. Mm -hmm. I mean, you couldn't make this stuff up. So how does the Virginia Constitution change, deal with this? You pick a name out of a hat, and that's exactly what happened. Wow. They, they, didn't, they picked it out of a vase. In fact, it was must-see TV in Virginia. Um, they put the names in little film canisters, the stuff you used to put, like, dope seeds in. You used to put the names in that, two black canisters. And then they put it in some famous vase from the Virginia, Virginia Museum of Fine Art. And before the drawing, somebody, you know, actually gave a big lecture on it. So they drew it, and the Republican candidate won. So the Republicans kept a one-vote majority in our General Assembly. Brings us up to 2017, or 2019, I'm sorry. Brings us up to our 2019 session, uh, which we're, we're dealing with now. The, the session is over. Um, there are, again, pro and Reggie, pro and anti bills in our General Assembly. The uh, pro, uh, the pro Reggie bill never made it out of committee again. The anti, uh, anti Reggie bill did. Uh, was passed again and the governor vetoed it. The veto was not overridden. So then um, they, uh, then comes the budget. And the Republicans put in the budget, and, and I say Republicans because this is strictly partisan. Strictly partisan. Um, the Republicans put in a, a provision in the budget saying that no one in the state, not DEQ, but no one in the state can expend any state funds at all to support joining Reggie. Or and TCI. it's it, it, and two CI. I, I don't think that's that was a, a separate provision talking about revenue. I don't think that's in the direct yeah. provision I'm, I'm thinking about, Dan, no. but it, it could be. I, I, yeah. we, I, I can show it to you afterwards. I think um, it does specifically say Reggie. It specifically yeah. says Reggie. Yeah. Um, so if that stays in, and, and it does the, say participation in as well. Yes, as it says participation. Yeah. It, it, it co they cover all their bases in yeah, that in yeah. that in that provision. Um, they use yeah, participation, join, join whatever. Yeah. Um, the, the, the intent is clear. <laughs> put it that way. Um, so at one stage, the governor amended it to take it out, and this gets into constitutional law and state constitutional law. The general assembly rejected his amendment on a, uh, uh, on a 50-49 vote. It was one, there was a one vote difference, the one vote that was picked out of a hat. Um, so it was, the governor's amendment was overridden, the language stayed in the budget. Now, the governor still has the option of vetoing that language, and he has until May 3rd to do it, and we don't know how this story is gonna end. There are pluses and minuses to the vetoing. Obviously, you know, vetoing it would make it, you know, would allow us to implement it, go on immediately. However, it will be subject. Either way, it's going to be subject to judicial review, and we are in a situation where nobody knows what the state constitution provides. 
But uh, you do have a line item veto, right? So uh, that we think. I think we have a line item <laughs> veto, but what I think doesn't matter, it's what it's what the right. what the courts think, and it is unclear as to what parts of a budget can be line right. item to what can't. So uh, so this, I mean, it, that's where we are. As you can hear, I wish me luck. None of this stuff is easy, right? I mean, it, uh, and and you know, eleven <laughs> years later, we look back on Reggie, and sometimes I wonder how we ever actually got the thing off the ground in the first place. But I'd actually, so I, I invited Dan up here because he's a sort of outsider, all this, looking in, calling around, find out what's going on, and I just wanted to get his perspective on, on Reggie, eleven years on, and and you know given that he also looks at what else is happening around the country, uh, I thought it might be useful to have someone who wasn't directly involved in it in some way to give some, sort of put it into some context. So Dan, do you want to just take a couple of minutes? And yeah, I mean, like, I think, I think Reggie's had, like, a pretty interesting evolution over those 11 years. I mean, just to go a little bit off of Michael, I mean, one of the things that I think people are looking at right now is you've got Reggie settled its... Uh, 2016 program review in December 2017. You had most of those states going through the process of implementing that regulation inside their own. So that's kind of baked into the price right now. And then you have Virginia and New Jersey that are kind of sitting there on the sidelines and people are waiting for them to kind of make that last step before you can kind of see how they might potentially impact the market because you want that certainty. Um, I think the thing with Virginia that you hear people talk about and that's interesting is uh, because of their legislative cycle, everybody's up at the same time. And you're talking about there's the potential that, you know, the, what it's, uh, three seats total yep. um, that you need to flip from Republican to Democrat, and you potentially would have a Democrat governor and Democrat legislature, and then it turns this whole discussion about what is Virginia, what, is it a participation, is it joining, is it not? So you have this, this ability that Virginia can evolve in a very short amount of time if it wanted to. Um, and the, the market dynamics there, I think, are probably quite different. So if you say that you're going to use consignment auctions, if you use California as your, your traditional um, example, a lot of consigning entities aren't necessarily, they don't have an incentive to go out there and be very proactive in the secondary market. They don't they don't have the same pressures as somebody that is just having to go buy allowances at auction, um, you know, like a fuel supplier or an industrial entity. So if, if Virginia entities got in that same situation and they're on the level playing field with a lot of the other Reggie states, then the market dynamic there changes quite a bit. Um, I came into the market right after the 2012 review, which was done by, by you, uh, and, and Reggie uh, just was, on a fucking tear. Uh, it went from two and a bit to eight bucks. And then, as Michael mentioned, the, the Supreme Court knocked down the uh, clean power plan, and we went from eight to four in five days. Um, it was a wild ride. Um, and then you kind of go into this program review. And I think the thing that came out of the program review is, is markets like certainty, they like to know what's going on and they like efficiencies and you know what was um, I guess viewed from the outside, you know this is going to be a year process, just seemed like it lagged a little bit. I will say to Reggie's defense, a lot happened in that time period. You had a clean power plan, you had um, a presidential election that I think uh, took some people by surprise and so what was you know supposed to be a very orderly quick process turned into a much longer process, and you saw Reggie prices kind of um, definitely get impacted by that. Since then, we've kind of had this, this wild ride. Um, one of the things that comes out is the ECR is a pretty uh, significant and interesting point, and people are now using that, I think, as a valuation point and saying, okay, um, the ECR is gonna come in in 2021 at six bucks. Uh, has the potential of removing 7.7 .7 million allowances, I think, off the top of my head. Um, so that's you know a decent amount. 10% of whatever the, the budget is. Yeah, so a, a decent amount of allowances that potentially could go out of the market. And so people are using that kind of as your valuation point and saying, okay, well, $6 in 2021, what does that mean today? And so you're seeing kind of this, this wave where we've you know kind of gotten up to five, gotten up to 550, and come back to five, gone up to 550, and 
just trying to constantly figure out what the right place is. Some of that goes back to the certainty about what's going on in Virginia, what's going on in New Jersey. You also have three states um, that have yet to implement the Reggie rule. So uh, I think once you have all five of these factors going on, um, you know, Reggie's kind of clearing all those hurdles and we can start, you know, so, on. so just on that, um, Andrew. I just want to make a comment on the 2016 program review. Yep. Because I just say, I think that was an incredible achievement, actually. Uh, rather than sort of being slow or took an extra year, the planning for 2016 was started in 2015 was all in on the Clean Power Plan. So with the election of the president in 2016, that really changed how we thought about moving forward. Uh, it was a very tumultuous time, and to bring those 11, uh, 11 states, excuse me, <laughs> nine states together <laughs> in time to do that, I thought was, was quite remarkable, and a credit to, again, the success of this program, the fact that everyone's in on this. So, it, right. it, yeah. It, yeah. Can I just add to that? As, mm. as an outsider, I've been, I mean, these are really very different states. Mm. Yes. I mean, you think of the Northeast as monolithic. It mm. is not. These are very different states and have worked with them together and separately. And, and to me, it, it's an amazing accomplishment mm. to bring such different states together working consensually like this. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I live in Vermont. You know, it's quite a, li quite a bit different from Maryland when you look at the you know, the number of people, the amount of urban area, that just as an example, and they all have their differences. And so I think that is one of the, the hallmarks of Reggie is not only this sort of built-in review processes we've been talking about, but also, um, you know, the consensus process, which, you know, certainly from my experience was, was all around the fact that, you know, we wanted to keep everybody together. Now, obviously, we weren't 100% successful there. New Jersey did leave, but generally speaking, it wasn't an idea where you were, you know, you couldn't, you can't force anything. It's not a compact. Um, you know, a, a state has to do its own regulation to, to participate. And so it's not like you can really force this on anybody. And so to keep the, the club together, um, you really have to use consensus. But can you just quickly update us on, in terms of that, I call it the 2017 program review mm -hmm. because that's when the model rule came out, mm -hmm. but um, where, what is the current status? Where are we at with the... In terms of the states? The states, yeah. Um, well, maybe Dan knows more than I do, but my, my numbers are four have definitely completed their, their rulemaking. <coughs> Five are in various stages uh, of, of completion. Um, I have actually my list. I don't know what what what, what is what you said. You there's three left. Uh, New Hampshire, New York, Connecticut. Yeah, and Connecticut I, should be done May 25th. New Hampshire, not entirely sure where their bill is from. Um, Jeb, whatever his last name is, Bradley, um, and then New York uh, is waiting on Virginia and New Jersey. Mm -hmm. The Massachusetts, I thought, had both the regulation it's and done. The, both are done. We're done. Okay. All right. Yeah. Breaking so, news. Right. <laughs> but I, but I think that also just this is another sort of challenge with R Reggie. And we have to remember that it's it's nine states, mm -hmm. you know, eleven states, hopefully. But you know, having all of just just sort of tracking those things, and I mean, I know the the Reggie Inc. staff. Mm -hmm. Um, have a lot of masters when it comes to these things, but but being able to keep all that together and then work with all these different jurisdictions, you know, some states have to go to their legislature to, to do a program review update. Other states can just do it. Um, they all have the different um, rules and the way they can operate within those rules, uh, even though they're sharing an auction platform. I mean, I just just on the program review, I think that the I'm not a trader, I'm not in the market, but I, I think the, the hurdles that you run is it, it's a little bit like politics. So, you know, you have a presidential election, it's a cool two years till you had midterms, and then you're into a presidential election again. With, with Reggie, what you end up being is, we're in 2015, we started the 2016 review, it ran all the way to 2017, you took another 18 months to two years to implement, and then, FYI, we're about to start another. About to yeah. start another, you know, and so it's you know. It's called it, continuous improvement. Yeah, I mean, like, look, I mean, like, that's not a criticism. Yeah. Like, I mean, if if you look at Reggie, what Reggie does is it says we need to have uh, 
every four years we need to have this review, and you know if that's a review that takes from uh, developing the rule to implementation is you know two years to 36 months, that's fine. I think people have that expectations, or you have the California model, which is let's do one every year for the. I mean, I'm pretty sure in five years they've done seven revisions, uh, or something along those lines. So. There's different ways to go about it. I think if, if the market has its certainty, if the market kind of knows what's going on, then it can adjust and adapt. It's when you, you have these, these lulls when nothing's going on that I think you can, you can lose some of the steam. And when you lose some of the steam, do you lose some of the incentive to make further emission reductions? You know, I mean, like if you go back and you, I mean, this is nothing to do with Reggie, but you look at having an $8 Reggie price versus having a $4 Reggie price in 2016, what are the emission re reductions that come at $8 or $9 that don't happen at four and five? And so if you're saying that the goal is to reduce emissions, you know, those prices bring different emission reductions over time. Right. I would just say that, you know, at Reggie, we don't even think, I mean, we know what the price is, but that's not something we manage around. Right. You yeah. know, we manage around, you know, the size of the budgets for the states, the, the overall cap for the region. Yeah. And, you know. No, I mean, that's what you should do. You're yeah. benevolent to the price. Right. You just want a well-functioning market. Sure. Right? Yeah. That's why we do things like the bank adjustment to help yeah. that. Right. And so just to sort of close out this piece, where is uh, New Jersey at right now? So New Jersey is also uh, do, uh, completing or in the process of completing their rulemaking. I would say that um, we should be hearing something uh, firm from them within the next two months. Right. And so then I had another uh, question, which I, I'm not sure whether you can answer or not, but you know, given the sort of what's been happening in Pennsylvania recently, mm -hmm. you know, they've, they've been participating in the TCI conversation on the transport side. Uh, they've also had this in-state sort of cap and trade program proposal. Mm -hmm. I just wondered, you know, do you have any sense, um, I mean, have they been talking to Reggie? Do you have any sense that they would be sort of the next one up if there was going to be another state? I'd like to tell my little anecdote about going to Pennsylvania to, uh, to actually sit with some of these uh, uh, sort of grassroots groups. And they basically said, or the legislature said, without grassroots efforts, nothing's going to happen in Pennsylvania. So I remember I had a, in the evening, I went to the state house and it was open and I walked around and I looked at the portraits of all the this guy was the speaker of, it actually said he was the speaker of the house from 2002 to 2005. Then he went to prison for five years. And then, and he wasn't the only politician that had it on his portrait. So uh, what's the point there? I think the point is uh, about Pennsylvania that, um, you know, they're, they're interested in doing something. This, this group, uh, this uh, economic council formed with, uh, I think there's a, a law school that also joined in. Uh, basically said that we think that there should be a cap and trade program, and they also said that they think uh, Reggie allowances should be used uh, to meet compliance obligations in a one-way uh, uh, linkage, as they called it. And that, that's been problematic for the Reggie states to have uh, uh, you know, independent th third, third actors say, we'll take Reggie allowances for compliance. So that's something that uh, the, the, the states have, uh, the agency heads have uh, basically said, and maybe in, in, in our chair, will communicate informally to uh, folks at DEP in Pennsylvania that that's probably not something that's going to you know, work for us to have that one-way linkage. But what's, it, what's your level? So let's just use New Jersey, Virginia, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. right? So New Jersey more or less has some legal legislative support for the program. So you're not necessarily going to see as much of a, a legal fight there. You got right. Virginia, which, Michael, you've already said, there's going to be some sort of constitutional uh, challenge to the program or the right to veto uh, the budget language. Then you got Pennsylvania, which the citizens' petition is saying, hey, let's use the state constitution to implement this program. Mm -hmm. As a Reggie program, how far out do you want to get on the ledge as far as legal authority to bring these people in? So you say, New Jersey, you come in, the chances that it blows up, relatively small. Pennsylvania, if they were to come in and there's a legal challenge and it blows up, it blows up inside of your program. So how do you silo the program? How do you protect the program against some of these legal 
challenges that potentially can have a pricing impact, can have you know, uh, different you know, market dynamics? So I would say, um, before I answer that, I would just say it's interesting to look at New Jersey because they've got their reg people and their legislature falling over each other. To, to join Reggie. It's sort of the opposite of, of, of what Virginia is going through. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the folks in, in the governor's office doesn't think they need legislation because they've got you know, the regulation and that's the it's way they're going. It's a fight to see who gets credit for joining. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> it's that sort of thing. But uh, you know, I can't answer that question because it's not sort of my responsibility. Uh, it would be the agency heads getting together in a consensus and saying, you know, is this, is this, is this a risk? You know, is, is, is it a risk or not? And, and how, would, how they would address it. So, um, Have I they think, had that discussion? Um, we had, well, we've been in discussions with both Virginia and New Jersey over time, and the, the confidence has been built uh, in through those discussions that we're, you know, the, the, the states have been very comfortable right. with well, how and, things and are going. I think this is a conversation that <clears throat> was had earlier, too. I mean, just in terms, there, there have been some challenges to Reggie in both mm -hmm. New Jersey early on and in New York. So I think Delaware also. And Delaware. So the, yeah. the question comes up from time to time. And I think, um, so one of the, the, it's just another one of the issues that goes along with being a multi-jurisdictional group. Now, recognize that each state has to have their own set of regulations and their mm -hmm. own program. So, um, but I think, you know, having seen what happened in Ontario with WCI, yeah. I, I think, it's, it's sort of incumbent upon all of us to think about divorce as well as marriage mm -hmm. in this case mm -hmm. um, and to keep that in mind. But I, I do want to open it up and see if there are any questions from the audience before we go too far, because we can sit up here and chat all day. But. Oh, no, they just wanted to chat. Oh, wait. There's two. Thank you. I'm Puneet Pujara from Autonomy Capital. Um, my question is more on a sort of big picture, what Reggie could mean if there is a Reggie at federal level type adaptation possible with new political cycle and or interaction of Reggie with WCI because you know, having a big sort of national market of some sort would, would be very helpful for, for secondary trading and and efficiency and, and things like that. So I don't know to what extent is this in the works or something that, you know, either a national type of Reggie or some sort of alliance with WCI. Thank you. Okay, well, I'll say, just say a few things about that. One is that um, there is a great deal of interest to, down in Washington on the part of uh, legislators who are interested in a national program. Uh, We've been asked to come down and talk about the success of the Reggie program to, to senators and, and to, and to uh, House members. Um, so that's there. In terms of uh, a national program, you know, Reggie worked closely, this was before I was at Reggie, but worked closely with the EPA and the federal government to help them design the Clean Power Plan uh, using a lot of the uh, sort of experience of the Reggie program. Uh, so we were looking at the CPP as sort of making sort of the rest of the country Reggie-like. Uh, Reggie was actually going to still be more stringent than the CPP in many regions. But anyway, that, that was the thinking there. I would imagine if a sort of a uh, federal government that had the mindset to do this, uh, we would probably uh, you know, sort of take off from where that was in terms of uh, where the CPP had been left. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, and so I'll just add an opinion there. I, I think that, of course, you know, Depending on the outcome of an election, all kinds of things are possible, right? I mean, it just. But I suspect that first of all, it's it's a number of years away, um, and a few lawsuits, and I think that when you talk about a say a Reggie WCI link, I think the challenge there, um, certainly as now an outsider, is that. You know, WCI is covering 85% of the economy, and Reggie's covering you know 10%. And it's, they're just mismatched enough, both in coverage and in price right now, that it's difficult to see how that would work. But um, uh, Yeah, I mean, like, I think you've got a couple of things. One, the price is too big. So either Reggie entities are getting paid. There's a massive arbitrage that happens there, which nobody's going to sign up for that. 
Um, the other thing I think you need politically, you have to have probably eight years of um, single government. So Democrat in the White House for eight years, um, Republican in the House, White House for eight years. So you get a solution to Mass versus EPA, which was supposed to be solved by Clean Power Plan, which got struck down. And now we have ACE, which is going to also get challenged. And it's just going to keep on going through this wash cycle. And we're never actually going to solve the question of what is mass versus EPA. So if you figured that one out, I think you can start to build support or an incentive for a more uh, federal program. And then I would get into the question about whether a federal program isn't necessarily taking Reggie Inc. and expanding Reggie Inc. It's taking Reggie Inc. as a model for what can happen and applying it to very specific regional set stand or, um, standpoints. So. MISO is a pretty good example. Could you have a Midwest um, you know, cap and trade program that deals with just those states? That probably makes a little bit more sense than saying, hey, we're going to have a, a you know, blanket approach. What works in Reggie works everywhere across. Probably isn't true. You probably need a very regional, ISO specific policy. Right. OK, is there, uh, I think there's another question in the front here. Uh, Ross Brown from the California Legislative Analyst Office. Um, I was hoping maybe you could speak a little bit more about one of the big issues here in California, I think, that still gets discussed is kind of the size of the bank of allowances. And uh, so I'm wondering if you could just kind of elaborate on kind of your, the process for tracking that issue and determining when and, uh, to make adjustments and how. And I think really the nature of the question is, you know, are there kind of lessons learned um, from your perspective that California should be kind of thinking about when thinking about that issue? Sure. Okay. So uh, the, the bank itself, we have, we, we, we monitor internally at Reggie Inc. as well as our market monitor does. So we compare and make sure that we're calculating the bank the same way. But basically, uh, you, you figure out all the obligations that are out there and how many allowances are out there and how many are excess of that. And what do you do about it? You know, some some folks think it's good to have you know a cushion there. It helps in the liquidity in the marketplace. Uh, I think others feel like uh, you know, the, the the greater the stringency, the better for the program. And if you look at you know 2012 when the when the decision was made that something had to be done about the bank and how that actually helped stabilize uh, the price of allowances, the decision was made to fully uh, account for the bank over a period of time. So that's what we, what the, the states decided to do uh, at the end of the last program review, was calculate the bank at the end of 2020, and then allocate uh, over five years uh, the adjustment in, the, uh, in the, you know, the regional cap for those five years. Uh, and I think that that has proven to be successful. Uh, be, probably the other reason it's proven to be successful is because emissions have been lower than we thought they were. So the bank <laughs> doesn't go away, it's still there. Scale is also different. I mean, you're talking about Reggie. Reggie's um, Reggie Bank. Reggie's bank right now is probably right around 100 million allowances. Call it like 95 to 100. Um, you had emissions in the 60s. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that you're oversupplied by 18 months. Um, California, if you look at the best available information right now, you're oversupplied by 243 million allowances in offsets. Um, California emitted 320, so you're nine months oversupplied. And if you say that any one of those individuals is holding a hedge position, then you can say, you know, that 243 doesn't actually feel like 243. It could feel like 100, where you know it's conceivable. You could say, hey, there's five big. Reggie entities that have a large compliance entity or compliance obligation, they could be hedging six months in the future, you know, 100 million allowances, that could be 30, 40 million allowances. So then you, that surplus might be problematic. Right. Yeah. So are there any other? I just had another question, Michael, for you. I, I'm sort of back to the governor's decision about vetoing or not. I mean, given that he's vetoed the sort of block blockers from join uh, from participating joining or otherwise talking to anyone from reggie's vetoed that twice or the previous governor vetoed it but um 
Why, why would he not the, veto it? The, the well, line item veto. Why well, would he not? Because there are some specific, wonderful, quaint aspects of budget law, constitutional Virginia budget law, that the budget in Virginia, the budget trumps anything. It trumps legislation. For instance, you could have a whole bunch of laws on the book about something, and the budget and there could be a line in the it notwithstanding any other statute in the state, the budget rules. Now, this has been controversial for many, many years. The budget is not a transparent document. It never has been. You know, it's it's not subject to committee hearing. Well, it is subject to committee hearings, but everything goes, you know, everything in the kitchen sink has gone into budgets. Um, the governor's in traditionally the governor's line item veto authority has been construed very narrowly. It depends where it's placed in the budget. It, it a whole bunch of things that I am not, you know, right, I, right. I'm not an expert in. So there are reasons you can veto right. a general piece of legislation, but you have to be very careful right. With about the what the impact right. could be of losing a court decision if if you veto parts of the budget. Right. But, but don't you don't you have the fallback <laughs> position that if you win the legislature? Well, yeah, but right. I mean, obvious. If the legislature changes next year, and it, you know, who knows. Who knows? That's we, this year. I that's this, this year. year. That's right. this year. The, the session would, would be, be the election right. session would be January yeah. of, of, of 2020. But your options um, here, right, correct, are you leave Reggie at the altar and you run away bride situation, right? Or <laughs> an imprisoned bride. Or, or you have the Las Vegas <laughs> wedding and you hope, you hope, hey, we can seal this up maybe in November, right? Well, and I think so, the, the other piece that plays in my mind I have mind no is comment that, about this. Right, the yeah. other piece that plays in my mind is the keep in mind the governor in Virginia is limited to one term, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So he can't run again. So if he wants Reggie in on his watch, you know, he, yeah. he will run out of time. Yeah. Um, and it just well, we'll see what happens I, yeah. in the next few I, I days. I mean, Dan, but, Dan you're, if 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 it does, if the legislature does flip in in this coming election, I would expect there to be pro-reggie legislation again that would pass. There would be some changes to it. Uh, the pro-reggie legislation before would authorize us to do a direct auction. And lots of folks would prefer to do that. So I would expect to see if the budget language, and in fact, with or without the budget, even if we go forward with reggie, I could easily see next General Assembly, if it's Democrats, telling us to switch to a direct auction method. Um, so that's there regardless, Dan. But, but would you, so, I mean, going down that but, path, you couldn't switch Flip the switch between direct and consignment auction. Yeah, um, we'll have to talk to Reggie about mm -hmm. that. I I suspect that it would be a lot easier overall to just do the direct auction. Mm -hmm. I, I doubt I'd get any pushback from from Andrew. How on quickly that one. could this legislation go into effect? Could it happen in the month of January? I don't know if it could go into effect that quickly. Yeah. I mean that, that all remains to be seen. Yeah. How quickly yeah. that would happen? Well, like I mean, you would also not do that. So say say it flips in Jan say it flips in November. You get a legislature in January 2020. Yeah. You say you implement it, in 2021. It, it probably could not be. Yeah, it could probably so like, would not have been done in 2020. But, but then, 2021. I guess my question is. Would you phase in? Is phase in like a reasonable path? Who knows? I'd like to ask questions. That have no <laughs> you mean phase in between mm -hmm. a consignment auction, phase in the, the direct auction over the well, consignment Well, I mean, that's auction. exactly awesome. what California is doing yeah. here. You're saying yeah. that natural gas entities are consigned 100, they're consigned allowances. They're required at some yeah. point in 2030 to consign 100% of those allowances. So that wouldn't right. necessarily, they wouldn't own those, but you could slowly kind of. You know, I, I suspect that's an option. Mm -hmm. I, so, you know, as, can't predict the future. As you can see, 11 years on, there's still <laughs> plenty to talk about. And I think that, you know, um, over the next couple of years, yeah. you know, there'll be more the, changes. Yeah, the only thing I could add to that would be that it would not be a decision Virginia would make on its own. would have to do right. it, obviously, consensually with the rest of the Reggie states as to how we would proceed like that. Right. Yeah. And I think that, well, I think the the states have done a really good job in the last 11 years in working together and but it certainly doesn't come easily and as the as they um, sort of start to move into different areas or sort of different politics you know that that's always something you have to work on um, although they get a whole new opportunity to work together on the transport side mm -hmm. so uh, and bring in some other players who haven't been as involved in the process but I think we're actually close to out of time at this point. Um, so I just wanted to make sure there weren't any other questions. That did. Yep. <clears throat> Hi.
Hi, I'm Jim Carruth. I'm with Incubex. Um, I just had a uh, kind of a broader um, macro question for you, which is um, if you look along the East Coast, there's a lot of offshore wind um, in development, and I'm just curious what your thoughts are um, about its impact. I mean, we're talking about um, a huge power transfer to the renewable space and what impact that might have on the REGI uh, program itself. Um, well, I, so I think it's a, it's a continuation of what we've already seen. I mean, there's been a lot of um, fuel switching. I mean, we had a move, you know, natural gas has come in you know, pretty strongly. I mean, the conversation around the, the bank and the, the REGI cap and whether it was too high that happened in you know 2010 and 11 was really around uh, the fuel switching that was um, you know s somewhat more aggressive than I think the the economic analysis that we originally did back in 2004 um, in in preparation for conversation around setting up the Reggie program I think it continues that and and just goes to the need in the program review to have a look at the cap and to look at the bank and work out um, whether there's opportunities for stringency, you know, for further stringency. Um, I think that the, the ECR is another way to try and sort of make the market act more dynamically in that sense and do more like a market would. So if the price gets too low that you, you know, in a regular sort of market where there's actual scarcity if the price gets too low people stop selling into that market you know and and the ecr helps to sort of do that but i don't know andrew whether you have any thoughts on it but it's yeah just in terms of the process that we use at reggie inc when we do a program review so all these states that are planning to do offshore wind that gets incorporated in the modeling that we use to figure out what the appropriate stringency is so yeah. And, and that you know that has come up with both Virginia and New Jersey in terms of wh how they should come in. You know, what are they what are they foreseeing in terms of renewables and other new energy sources? And 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 I'll just add, you know, the landscape changes every day. Um, we went out and remodeled during our pendency of, with Reggie because in our General Assembly session in 2018, uh, we passed uh, the General Assembly passed something called the Grid Transformation and Security Act, which is requiring our electric utilities to. Uh, develop 5,000 megawatts of renewable zero emission energy between now and 2030 and also invest over a billion dollars in energy efficiency projects. Is that going to, even without Reggie, is that going to affect carbon emissions in Virginia? Absolutely. Um, it brings it down, obviously. So, so yeah, that landscape's changing all the time and, and it drives down carbon emissions, absolutely. I mean, I'm willing to have like the shitty fucking opinion here, um, <laughs> which is, um, <laughs> If you think climate change is a thing, which it is, uh, and it's not a hoax, you should have the expectation that the weather only gets worse, that we're going to have hotter summers, we're going to have colder winters, you're going to have more extremes just in general. And you, when you look at the Northeast, one of the things that you do see quite often is whenever we do have these extreme weathers, we typically see high emissions. Right. Um, That's true. And you see very high power prices. Um, and that's indicative of, you know, maybe there's potentially not enough um, supply and you just have to go to whatever can keep the lights on. And so I think wind is great, but the question comes down to when we get into these tight points, whenever, whenever we are constrained, what's, what's keeping the lights on for mom and dad? Is it nat gas? Is it solar? Is it wind? What's the thing that we're, what's our go-to that we know is gonna be able to run, be able to supply that generation? Um, I mean, it's gonna be a transition. Over time, it's gonna be more and more renewables, but does that happen tomorrow? Who knows? Right. So then I just had one other sort of question for the group, and that was uh, around the secondary market and um, how important you think it is um, you know, maybe this is more for Dan. I mean, he's probably, I know that Reggie Inc. doesn't spend a lot of time on the secondary market because they're full-time running their origination auctions and making sure that that process goes smoothly, and it has, you know, it's had 11 years of pretty smooth operation. Yeah. But I, in well, I would just say yeah. before we go to Dan, I, I think we believe that it's been a powerful, uh, positive yep. uh, thing for, for the Reggie market to have that there. I think it's, I mean, like, I think, obviously, I think it's great. I mean, like, if you look at 
um, these markets, you, you want a price signal, you want a, uh, a reason or an incentive to you know, reduce emissions. And, you know, I think it's, I think it's just, it just makes sense, you know. And there was a technical issue that we had, and if New Jersey doesn't join Reggie, our biggest utility, Dominion, would have to, could have to purchase more than 25% of the Reggie allowances with that big, which is actually against the Reggie auction mm -hmm. rules. So our biggest utility might have to go on the secondary market just to meet mm -hmm. compliance. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> so or Reggie needs it's to change its rule. Well, I don't think that's going to happen. We've already talked about that. We've talked about it. I don't think that's going to happen. It's a long market. process. <laughs> it's a long process. And, and one that's not so necessary. So the, the point of the story, of your story, is New Jersey saving the day. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, on that note, yeah. I want to thank the panelists for their time, and I thank, want to thank you for your attention, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.